ACL Nation, what is up? Welcome into episode 21 of Bagging and Bragging. As you can see, I'm on the road. I've made it to Arizona. Mish will be here in a few days. And uh, we got ourselves a shootout and an open. We're coming off of the national. We got two people coming out of the national who I think are being very, very hot right now as far as throwing on the boards go. Tony Smith, no doubt about it. He'll be here. We'll also talk with AJ Sims about how things are going this season for him. And uh, now a little mindset with me segment at the end. No highlights to go over with. So we're going to have a little bit of fun here, do things a little differently. How are you doing, Mish? I'm doing good. I, you know, we're recording in the evening to kind of yeah. – work around this crazy travel schedule so it's kind of different but it's as we've said we've um we've we've got a lot of bloopers <laughs> so it's been a fun yeah. <laughs> a fun thing so far <laughs> almost makes us want to do it live you know like let's just let yeah. it roll live and let the people see what our personalities actually look like <laughs> i mean it's it's uh, it's a thing it's definitely a thing <laughs> now, are you guys doing league on wednesdays anymore or are you guys shut down on wednesdays yeah, we don't have a venue right now, so um, it sucks, but at the same time, the timing is kind of ideal because we lost our venue in May when the travel schedule gets crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and so as much as I'm sad not to have the venue and not to be able to run our league, it's kind of like divine timing because the because we always fly out, I always fly out on Thursday mornings, and it's usually early morning, and our league was Wednesday night, which means I wasn't getting home till like midnight and then trying to fall asleep and then waking up a couple hours later and having to start my travel with no sleep. Yeah. Uh, now do you sleep on travel days? Cause I, I can never sleep on travel days and it seems like I every day is a travel day for me. I can't sleep on airplanes. So that parts out. So <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that would be so convenient, but I can't. And so when, I, when I get like two hours of sleep, I'm just a disaster. <laughs> yeah. I drove back from Wyoming and I got about, eight, nine hours in on the drive, pulled over to hotel, you know, like one o'clock in the morning, tried to sleep. And as, as tired as I was, I was just tossing and turning, tossing and turning. I ended up getting four and a half hours of sleep and finishing the last seven hour drive, rushed home to sell my coffee tables. And I was supposed to get there at two o'clock. I, I got there at two o'clock and they didn't show up till six thirty. So four and a half hours late. What? That's worse than the like the plumber or the cable guy or whatever. <laughs> the only reason I rushed home is because they offered me more than what I put on Facebook Marketplace for, which yeah. Facebook Marketplace, that's a whole show in itself. Have you seen um, uh, yeah. Have you seen the comedy thing Nate Bragazzi talks about Facebook Marketplace? Uh -uh. <laughs> He's like Best case scenario, you get, you know, $5 for your thing. Worst, worst case scenario, they murder your entire family. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you're like telling yeah. random people where you live and come on over. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, you know, can I come pick this up? And I was like, yeah, no problem. He's like, okay, cool. Can I send you a pin to reset something on Facebook? And what's your cash app? I'm like, oh, here we go deleted <laughs> but but yeah i'm always luckily i live in an apartment complex so i'm kind of just like yeah come to the apartment complex and then whenever you call me outside i'll tell you which apartment i live in because it was definitely you sketch for like, the first you in your apartment complex it's a gamble it's 200 dollars, mish you got to take that gamble best case scenario 200 dollars. <laughs> worst case scenario he murders you and your entire yeah. family <laughs> but no it, it was. It's been a pretty fun last couple of days. It's kind of a segue into my bragging segment here. Um, I know that you travel a lot, like I do, and I'm going to brag on people watching in the airport. It's <laughs> okay. There, let's go. It's probably my favorite thing to do. I mean, you got your head bobbers where the guys like, you know, are like they're going face down. They're not or ready to fall asleep. Drop, or they drop their phone, like their phone, like yeah. watching their phone, and then they fall asleep and it falls out of their hand. <laughs> yep, and then uh, you got the you got the people with kids. That's always fun. Like the the moms are just done. They they are tired of traveling. They're ready to be on the plane. The, 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 yeah, yeah. The dad's job is to carry the backpack and the binkies and the sippy cups, and the mom has to deal with the kid. I'm just sitting here watching, just kind of laughing, like you know. And they're still sweet talking. You're going to be good on the plane, aren't you? And you're like, you know, damn well he's not. <laughs> no, there's the thrash. It's starts off like okay we're gonna yep. go in an airplane like yep. it's all it's all peppy and then two seconds later it's like would you just stop it <laughs> like, yeah, and, and then you get the dad work. over here with the goldfish cup <laughs> eating the goldfish that's supposed to be for the kid <laughs> watching the mom 
uh, and then, and then my, my grand finale is whenever you finally get to your destination and you go to the carousel and you see these people who are in such a panic that they're not going to be able to get their suitcase off that carousel. And they're like, they're following it around the thing, trying to lift this heavy bag off the carousel, almost falling over because like everyone's got to get front row seats to the carousel, right? You know, you have to get up front row. If you're in the back row, your thing's just going to go around and then you got to wait a whole nother three minutes and who has three minutes. So, nope. yeah, yeah. so then sweet little old grandma's coming up trying to lift her 50 pound bag off the carousel. And nobody's helping her anymore because why would we? It's, you know, so she's almost falling over. And oh my gosh, it, it was, it was some great people watching today, even though our flight was delayed a couple hours. And then I almost got in a, you know, road rage traffic fight today <laughs> here in Arizona. Uh, traffic. Yeah, I was saying to you earlier, like, what is appealing about Arizona? Because I can't find one thing. Yeah, well, th they're doing a lot of construction. So you'll see it tomorrow on the way from the airport to here. There was two wrecks. So I was going like 20 miles an hour. Then we finally got to the home stretch. It says 12 minutes away on the GPS, but no, they got more construction. So it's a three-lane highway, and it merges down to two and then down to one. And, uh -huh. you know, I was in the far right lane. I'm like, oh, okay, I got to get over. So I got over the second lane. And we didn't know that it goes down to one lane because there's a, a big van in front of me. You know, I can't see over the van or anything. So the van hurries up and guns it at the stoplight and cuts over. And then I'm like, oh, I got to get over, you know. So then the proper technique for all of you out there that don't know how to drive in situations like this is you're supposed to zipper. Yes. It works one, a lot one, better one, if you one, zipper. One, one, one. <laughs> yes. So this six foot ten, 420 pound guy who's like, you know, heads like this in the van. He's in a big van next to me. Like he's tall. He's and he he won't let me in. And I'm like, I'm talking. I could literally tap his hood. I rolled down my window and I was like, "You're supposed to zipper, bud." <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting angry and I could see. How, I said, "You're supposed to zipper, bud." And like I, I thought about hitting his hood because he was that close, and and I, I didn't I I didn't do it. And uh, I I got in front of him, so I. I I won the battle. I got in front of him, but then when it went back to two lanes, you know, he passed me right in front. And then it turns out he, we were turning on the same street here to the hotel and I actually passed in front of him and then I cut him off to pull him to the hotel. So I got the last laugh and, you know, no fighting, but people watching <laughs> the theme of the weekend. Well, it's like if he was pulling it. Yeah. If he was pulling into the hotel and you guys like walk in, you're like registration. Like, hey, um, man, what's up? Yeah. no, I would have I stood my ground. I would have taken a beaten, but I've been, Got a zipper, bud. <laughs> how do you, how do you not know the technique? Come on, people. Oh, man. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break and be back with our interviews right after this. All right. We are back with AJ Sims. And AJ uh, works at Texas A&M. He throws buffalo bags. He has been an ACL pro for four years. Uh, been playing cornhole for five years, has one beautiful wife and four amazing kids. Glad to know you have one wife, AJ. That's a uh, solid information there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you gotta, you gotta make it nowadays. You gotta make it known. <laughs> Just the <laughs> one. <laughs> um, but what's really interesting to me is, you know, cause I've talked to you a, a few times, but I didn't realize, you know, five years playing cornhole, four years pro. So it didn't take long for you to catch that pro title there. So I'd love to just know what that process was to get started is at the highest level so quickly. So, man, we, we hopped right into it. Uh, uh, you know, former pro Josh Gross, you know, he's he's my boy. We started together basically the same day, played softball. Our softball team sucked, and we would always go 0-2 in these little softball tournaments, so we needed something to do. So a guy brought out some cornhole boards, man. We started playing right away, and we're so competitive, man. We'll try to skip rocks. As, you know, whoever skips rocks the best. Whoever has the most hits in the softball tournament, like, we're super competitive. So he pulled the boards out, and, man, we were hooked, you know, because cornhole, you're either really good at it or you're really bad at it. And, you know, we uh, started out, we were both really bad at it, but we would one-up each other by, you know, by either hitting one bag or so. So, man, starting out, like, I was just so competitive that I wanted to play it so much. And we would go back and forth where he's better than me, I'm better than him, he's better than me. Before you know we're playing three hours a day every single day. So it didn't take long. Like, I think I played one social tournament. And then after I played in that one social tournament, I went straight to open, like, the very next tournament. So 
I've been pretty much open. I don't have the. I never played competitive or intermediate. I went from social to being able to throw eights to like throwing some tens, you know, here and there. And I, you know, I wanted to get out there. I wanted to play against the best straight up. So yeah, I never had the story of playing intermediate. So I went straight to advanced right away. You miss playing softball at all? I mean, yeah, I kind of do, but uh, all my kids play baseball, so I kind of pitch to them in the cages, and we throw all the time. So that kind of, you know, that kind of scratches that itch a little bit right there. Man, I'm old. I ain't trying to picture run, you man. being the pitcher. I can picture you being the pitcher. So, yeah, yeah, I used to pitch, man. Uh, I used to pitch. You know, I really can't play. I'm left-handed, so I really yeah. don't play too much infield. You know, they always want – and I'm too short to play first base and too old to play outfield. I ain't trying to be running out there, so – Picture it, picture it is, man. <laughs> picture it is. <laughs> I was going to yep. say, I think I, I think I found my problem. I think I've been an intermediate player for like two solid years here. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think there, there needs to be a time limit on it, man. If you're intermediate for, you know, about six months, you either uh, move up or go in and commentate. <laughs> I think that, I mean, he's calling us out like that, huh? I mean, I think that's what you got to do, though. You got to you gotta move yourself up, though, me. Just do it. Get your ass kicked for like a year. The next thing you know, you'll be elite. Oh, no, see, I'm just going to compensate. <laughs> see, that's the, that was the beauty for us, man. We knew that uh, we changed our throw, like, because that was the difference for us. We all started out with, you know, I used to ball the bag up and throw it. And then, mm -hmm. you know what, Josh got a flat bag a lot faster than me. And then he was kicking my butt. I couldn't do nothing with it because I couldn't predict what my bag was. So I would go home and practice on my throw and then go to his house and then use whatever that was to compete with him. And that's, that was like a measuring stick for me at all times. Like, all right, you know, he beat me five times in a row. Well, he started beating me three times and then two and one. And then it went the other way where I started beating him all the time. So we both was like going off of each other, kind of like slingshotting off of each other. And uh, man, it worked. Like, that's what it was. Like, you, you got to get your butt kicked at some point to know where you are, man. And that's what it was. Like, yeah. get your butt kicked early on. And that's why, I, you know, where I am today. So yeah, so are you, are you part of this uh, crew that says, you know, you got to throw a flat bag or else you're not going to be good in this game? Nope, I am not. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in having to throw a flat bag to be able to throw because, like, there's no statistic on flat bags. Yeah, you – the, yeah. the I, I have a flat bag at some times. Like, I mean, it's weird. Actually, when I throw off board – I have a, a more of a cut bag than I do when I throw on board, like just because I throw a tilt. And like I play my tilt. I play the tilt. Like I got, I go left to right a lot. I'm left-handed, so my bag goes left to right. It works, you know, really good to go around bags easier. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of like having a perfect throw in order to be great because all of the good players, like they all have different throws and different styles. Like you never know what you're gonna get. That's the beauty of our like league. Like there's no one dominant person. Ever like you go into a tournament and you say Justin Burton Jr. is going to win today? Like you don't know that. Yeah. You don't know what's going to happen. Like you don't know what the boards are going to play. So it's the mystery of our game is what makes our game so unique. Because you never know like who's throwing style, who's going to win. It may be fast bags, it may be sticky bags. Like Tony Smith, you know, in that the, the the most amazing game ever. Like Tony threw the opposite of what he's known from. Like he's known for being a block roll cut, and he just threw straight in the hole. So like. It can, it can vary, man. So, like, I'm not a fan about just having uh, flat bags go in. If you know how to use your cut bag, you know how to use your bounce bag or whatever, not flat bag, like, use it. Like, Yeah, Anthony's been trying to get me to change my throw for the longest time, but I'm like, man, I know exactly what my claw grip does. I know how it goes left to right on the board and sneak around that blocker. So, if I can just get the consistency down, I think that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in there with you, man. And we look at Alan Rawls. He's the same guy, saw blade. You know, he ain't throwing flat bags. He don't care. Nope. I'm not throwing that at all. Jaime, Jaime doesn't even throw a good bag. He's, he's been lights out this year. Hey, the craziest thing about Jaime, man, we 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 changed this throw completely from from where it was. Like, uh, a lot of people don't know. Like, when we started, when we, when we got into our partnership, uh, he throws fast bags. You know, that's what he, that's his style. He's only thrown fast bags, and he used to have his little hop flip throw before he started. Uh, we went to the very first open of the year in South Carolina, and we threw sticky bags, and let's just say it didn't go well. Like, man, it, it, like his bags was cutting all over the place, and then he committed himself to say, hey, you know what? I realized that I have to be better for us to compete. I have to be better. I can't take the bags that you're great out of your hands 
So what I need to do is get to that level with these bags. And he went and revamped his throw completely, like to where it is now. Like what you see now is a completely different throw than he's ever done in his entire life. And it's working. So, I mean, yeah, he's doing good. You know, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's ugly. You know, he gets called out a lot of times for it being so unorthodox. But in the same you know manner, like he's throwing averaging 10, 8 PPR in certain games with that throw. So. I'm not gonna tell him get a flat bag. No, nah, keep throwing ten eights. Like whatever it gets in, that's what I care about. I was gonna say I feel like you can get away with that, or, but I do feel like one very important skill for an elite cornhole player is speed control. Um, like you have to know where your bag is gonna land, and and if you're going for an air mill, you have to understand the distance. If you're going for a block, like I feel like that's the thing that really takes people to the next level. Uh, like, what are your thoughts on controlling the speed of the bag? So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. But, again, it's like practice repetitions. Like, you see it all the time. You, you know how you're – like, it might look crazy to us when we see it, but when you're seeing someone with the ugly throw or even the controller to speed, like, they're practicing it that way. So, yeah. to them, that's normal. So, it's – uh, but I would agree uh, controlling the speed of the bag on air mails and having the same throw. Like, you're – I see a lot of people that throw their air mail different than they throw their normal slide. That would be confusing to me. Like, I can't do that. Like, I want my slide and my airmail to be an uh, extension of each other. Like, I'm just going to extend the bag even more for my airmail. I don't want to throw a completely different shot. Like, you stay in rhythm, like, you know, that way, whenever you're able to throw the same arm rhythm the same way. Like, to me, it's better that way. Yeah, for sure. All right, we'll talk about that more in just a second. Take a quick break. Come right back after this. We are back. We were talking about speed control and you were starting to talk about how you don't want to have to change your throw for an air mill. Like, and, and I'm curious, how does that resonate with other shots? For example, a push shot, I noticed that's when people maybe will do a step through or um, a kind of maybe come back farther in their backswing. So like, can you talk more about how you may or may not change throws for different kinds of shots? Okay, so a, a push shot? Yeah, I absolutely change my throw for that because you're needing more force. A lot of times, uh, if you throw the same shot that you throw for a push shot for a normal bag, you're gonna end up throwing a lot of bags off the board. Uh, cornhole, believe it or not, is a finesse game. Like, I wanna be like in front of the hole. I never wanna hit the back of the hole. If I'm throwing a regular slide shot, I want my bag to crawl right in the front of the hole every single time. Uh, some people do the opposite. Some people throw so hard that it goes straight to the back of the hole. That's the opposite of what I, what I want to do when I play. If I get a short blocker out of that, you know what I'm saying, by just not throwing it hard enough, at least I'm in the front. I don't want to ever be to the point to where I throw a perfect, accurate shot and it goes straight over the hole. And a lot of times people extend those push shots. So uh, a lot of times it's based off the distance and the stickiness of the board. It's like the boards are really sticky and you want to do a push shot, yeah, you pretty much got to put everything into it, no matter what kind of bags you're throwing. Yeah, it's really easy to meet it off the back if you do it that way, you know. You set him up for that, AJ. Thanks a lot. <laughs> What'd you say to to meet it off the back? Meet it off the back. It? Yep. yep. Oh, I throw so, a little hard. Okay, everybody I, you lack, know. I lack the speed control. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we gotta find that. You gotta find the finesse. I mean, and and there's some pros that have the same thing that they can only throw one like elevate like their bag elevates only to a certain extent. Like maybe like even sometimes 30 degrees, like not even going like all the way up. And they throw a lot of bags off the bat, you know. But if there's a push, uh, they'll hit the push most of the time. But if you go look at their stats, man, they're throwing a lot of bags off the back because they're throwing a lot harder. Right. I'm curious, AJ, you know, you've been in the game for a while. And I've asked this question to other pros, but like what's your big why or like what motivates you to do this? Because it takes a lot of work and it takes a grind and you have a job and you have kids and the family and all that. So what is it about Cornhole that keeps you so excited about competing? So uh, when I started, like I said, it, I started with family. You know, I started with Josh. Like Josh is like a brother to me. And, you know, I just, like I said, I just left Josh. Our kids are on the same baseball all-star team. And that was the reason, like, we all did it. So we were, saw each other every weekend. The group did it. That's what they did for leisure time. Like, I don't drink and all that stuff. So to hang out with people, like, this is what we were doing. And, like, it, I just fell in love with it. And, uh, you know, not to share a sob story or anything, but the truth of the reality is Cornhole is a, 
a huge financial like uh, backing and helping and support my family because before I did cornhole, like I worked like two and three extra jobs before I started that. And I used to work around the clock, like two jobs to be able to I have four kids. So, I mean, you know, I got it. Four kids are expensive. As soon as I started playing cornhole every year, man, the money just started going up and up and up. And as I started performing better, started winning tournaments. So it was a way to like just supplement income. And every year it's been like, <clears throat> I mean, growing up like dramatically. So I do it for the finance. Like it, yeah. it's very expensive. It, it's very expensive. But at the same time, like I'm able to have great sponsors like, you know, Buffalo, you know, and great sponsors like, you know, uh, Scorebox 21 and SSC, the company that I actually work for. They sponsor me also. And, it's you know, it's some nice. It's a nice sponsorship, you know. Uh, so, I mean, for me, it's it, it's the money now at this point, like being on TV. Like I never thought I would see myself on ESPN, CBS Sports, so video game? Myself, I mean, like, on a video game, like, are you serious? Like, and even that <laughs> is extra sponsorship, you know, possibilities because I can, you know, my resume just keeps like yeah. building and building and building. So I imagine next season, even more sponsorship and revenue will come this way. So to me, it's about, you know, putting my family in a better position to be successful. So it sounds like you're always looking one step ahead. You know, on my long drive back from Wyoming and the drive out here, I was listening to your guys' podcast, man. So I think he's coming after our job, Mish. Talk a little uh, bit about the boys. And that uh, was it off the board. Is that right? <clears throat> yeah, off the board, man. So is, is, that, uh, is that Buffalo and them? Or yeah, who, yeah. So, so, that's Buffalo. Okay. So, so that's that's a Buffalo podcast. Uh, before I ever signed to Buffalo, they had like a little podcast that they had started. And like this was a long time ago before any of these podcasts that came up. They had just kind of like they interviewed me and Josh like as like a, in like one of their little podcasts. Well, long story short, I ended up signing to Buffalo. And the first thing that I told the owner, it was like, hey, I want to get the podcast back going. Like, I mean, I love to talk like these interviews. Like, I mean, you can see I breeze through, you know, the first eight minutes like it wasn't nothing, you know, so. <laughs> right, so for, we for definitely me, appreciate it too. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, so for me, I love to talk. I love to to share what I call is game and knowledge with players. And like, I do it every single day. One of my biggest things is I give back to the youth player, like the young players that are coming in, don't know anything about sponsorships. Like I've brokered so many sponsorship deals through like being like a cornhole agent, you know, just because like, it's so much of that going on. Like some of these top players that y'all know today, I help negotiate their deals. Like I do a lot of that stuff behind the scenes just because I love to do it, you know, and yeah. I have a lot of knowledge. Yeah. yeah it's, that's it's, huge. I mean, yeah. Cause the, the sponsorship market, you know, you have sponsors that take advantage of some of these players uh, and, you know, use their platforms to grow their business. And then the next season they decide to say, you know what, uh, we'll take everything you helped us grow, but we don't need we don't you wanna, anymore. We don't want to pay yeah. you anymore. <laughs> right. We don't want to pay you anymore. So now you take these players that are loyal and put everything they have into these brands, but then have nothing to show for it. And like, that's the one thing that I kind of teach. Like, it's not really a seminar or class, but I talk to these pros because I've seen that. It actually happened. It actually happened to me. So I learned from that myself and put myself in situations to where, it's not like one year deals, it's multiple year deals that I can do this and, you know, negotiating incentives and stuff like that. So, I mean, again, that's what the podcast that I'm on, you know, off the board podcast, that's what it's about. So, I just, you know, check that out. We check y'all out. Y'all check us out, man. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. I've, been, I've been listening the last couple of the trips I've been on, man. So and uh, up there in Wyoming, you got a lot of Buffalo supporters up there in Wyoming. They're begging me. They're like, you got to do a collab with Buffalo. I'm like, we'll see what happens, man. But AJ, man, I didn't, uh, I didn't really talk to you at all that much last year, dude, but I got a lot of respect for you this year, mainly because of the stuff you're talking about now through that podcast. So keep it up, brother. Hey, good deal, yeah. man. I appreciate it. Yeah, AJ, we so appreciate you. Everyone go listen to the podcast, and thank you so much for spending some time here with us today, and we're rooting for you. Absolutely. I appreciate it. All right, thank let's you. go. All right, welcome back. We are with our second guest, Tony Smith, coming off of an incredible uh, weekend over at our second national, uh, potentially one of the greatest games we've ever seen. Uh, definitely really entertaining. And what was 
most interesting to me, Tony, is the fact that you only missed, what was it, like four or five bags the entire game, which is not the typical Tony Smith style. So talk to me about that game. Uh, I had to switch up basically my whole play style for that game, or for both games, really. Uh, there wasn't really any blocking going on or anything that I would usually do. The boards were a little bit quicker than the other venue. And I was using faster bags. So I was really just trying to race, just put every bag in the hole. I mean, was that like uncomfortable for you? Or did, I mean, it sounds like a silly question because you obviously played so well, but like, were you in the pocket? Like, were you comfortable or were you kind of like, ah, this is not my preference? I was extremely comfortable, actually. Um, I've been kind of tra like slowly transferring over to the just racing everything like that kind of style the last month, maybe two months. And why is that? Uh, just the way that carpet bags are this year. It just they they're the same field. 10 times more difficult than they were. Than trying to get the bags just to fall in the hole or chore when they're so sticky and so big. So you think that's the difference? They're just big, a bigger template? Yeah, the bigger template caught up on the hole uh, so much more often. <laughs> He's connected to the car. <laughs> the headphones died. So, so you, you, you and Jake decided, all right, enough is enough. This carpet stuff ain't working for us. Let's bring on slinky season. Talk to us a little bit about the conversations you guys had. They're trying to figure out what bags you guys are going to bring into play and how it worked so far. Uh, we've been playing with um, with convicts. They're they're like a surefire esque bag. They're still like a they're still fairly sticky. So enough that I can like I can block and roll and still do all that fun stuff with them. But they're a lot more forgiving. Like I can just switch and just start throwing every bag in the hole without really a problem. Um, they still they still have all of the. Yeah, one thing I love about you, uh, carpet players, is like nobody cares about your stupid PPR, and all of a sudden you guys get some slinkies in your hand. Now you start throwing high PPRs, and you guys are posting it just like everybody else. I don't post nothing. I don't okay. Post nothing. <laughs> I, I do like to go and look at every now and then. So you talk about I'll it. Talk, I'll talk about it. I'll talk about some perfect games. I'll talk about that. <laughs> but like, what do you feel like is most impressive to you about what you guys did in that game? Cause there's so much that stands out, but like you knowing yourself and your style as a player, like what are you most impressed with in your, in what you were able to do? Um, I think I'm, Definitely with how we kept our composure. Like, especially, like, Phil hitting that clutch airmail, the the intensity went up by a million. Like, I thought they were going to get momentum and just never miss again that game. Yeah, it, it, um, felt, it felt like it shifted heavily. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely thought it, it could, but I somehow kept my – kept my cool and just kept running bags uh we had a few missed huge opportunities to end the game uh, i thought that something was just going to flip and we were going to mess it up but we just kept our cool and just kept putting bags in the hole so i, I was sitting behind you and there was one moment where you're like i just need him to finish it down there i don't want to throw again <laughs> yeah I, I, was, I knew i was going to miss eventually like it, it was coming Luckily, he missed when I did, so that that was good. Yeah, like at that point when you started to get a little bit nervous when he made that clutch shot and you thought, like, can we really maintain this? Was that like a conscious conversation in your head that you were like, no, just you're fine? Like, what was that? How What, how, what was happening in your head at that time? If you haven't even remember, if you can remember it. And Jacob was really stressing me out. Uh, <laughs> He he threw great, don't get me wrong, but he was stressing me out that game because I couldn't tell what was going on in his head if he was starting to get like if he was starting to get iffy or not, 
Well, uh, right before that fill shot, though, you kind of slowed him down a little bit because he was like, no, I just need to get one in the hole. Well, no, and, he was still around it. And I was like, just go straight up the middle, just right through it. it. You don't need both of them, but, like, at least use it. Don't go around it. Yeah, I think you guys are both on the same page saying the same thing. But in that moment, you guys both, I think, psyched each other out. No, he he wanted to completely avoid the bag and slide right around it on the left side of it. So he stepped out, but he accidentally threw it to the right and ended up pushing it up. But he wanted to go completely around it and not touch it. Hmm. And I was like, no, just what, what are you thinking right now? Just go straight up the middle. Just push it in. Who's the off on this relationship, Mish? <laughs> I, I don't know i was gonna bring up the fact that you know one of the things that's new this season is the shot clock and and you know this was a rare time that both of you used all four timeouts and you know obviously phil barely getting that bag off in time like were you guys aware of the fact that you didn't have any more timeouts left and was that weighing on you at all watching the shot clock so i thought that we already ran out of timeouts in that that exact shot where he was gonna just push him in and he was just about to run out of time. I was like, shoot, just do it. Because I thought that he, he had no more timeouts left. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> We're screwed, yeah. And, yeah. I was like, oh, that's that's it. So I yelled at him. And then we had one more. And I was like, oh, thank God. Thank God. <laughs> but, yeah, and Speaking of which, because one of them was called out on you. you. You had a shot clock violation. They called the timeout. You were about to throw, and then they kind of waved at you like, hey, this is now a timeout. And you kind of looked startled, and you still made the bag. Um, but, like, do you think this is going to affect our gameplay, like having to notice this stuff and pay attention to it? Um, so from what I've noticed, it, it really – the shot clock really only is that – enforced like on broadcasts like uh, over on like the side course court 25 nobody's really going to call it yeah but, um on the on the main stage it is intense and it it really does change the intensity of the game you have to be conscious of that and like so many other things try to be quick at all times and yeah. like when we all ran out of timeouts, it was crazy because we, you, nobody had time to think or do anything. We all just had to fire instantly. And I, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Okay, that could help you. Could yeah. help you though. You take the mind out of it, right, Mish? That's right. We'll get more into that in just a second. Take a quick uh, commercial break. Be right back after this. So we're talking about the uh, timeouts and all of that. And you did bring up the fact that, you know, once the timeouts were done and you guys had to be rapid fire that you, you liked that. It made me think of the first national. There was that shot. Jake Gore had a shot to make and he took a timeout. He walked to the other side to his family, walked back and he ended up missing that shot. So you bring up a good point. Sometimes too much time is a hindrance. Yeah. Like Phil, when he took like, Two, two minutes for one bag. I think he missed that one. No, that was, the, that was the airmail. That was the airmail you hit. No, no, no. The airmail, he had no time. Yeah, that, that same round. All in the same round. It was the same round, but the one that yeah. he, he missed was when he took two full timeouts. Yeah, I'm off the side, yeah. That was ridiculous. Two minutes for one <laughs> shot? Well, and, and oh. it's... Yeah, so you really don't want to be in your head that much. That's a long time, right? There's a difference between kind of settling in and being like, you got this, and then going back into automation. But I do think too much time is a bad thing. Um, and and that's and that's what we're all going to be learning as we, as we navigate this, right, with the shot clock and all of that. Um, but are there any other, like, changes or things now that you, you've been on the broadcast quite a bit, you've been having a lot of success, like anything else that you're noticing up there that you would like to be changed, different things you like? On the broadcast, no. I, I I enjoyed it a lot. It was very smooth. And I wouldn't change anything about it. Cool. The only thing I could think of is, what, wouldn't it be nice to kind of have your timeouts posted somewhere that you could see it? Yeah. <laughs> like a little tally? 
Because I about I about crapped myself up there. <laughs> I can imagine. So, so how much further out are you guys here from Arizona? Uh, I'd say about three hours. About three oh. hours. And then we're going to be hitting the golf links tomorrow. And Misha, I'm not sure if you know this about uh, Big Tone, but Big Tone's a phenomenal golfer. Even though I uh, drove him by like 10 yards, uh, we don't need to go into the details about how that happened. But uh, Big Tone's a phenomenal golfer, phenomenal war zone player. Like, Tony, tell me something that you're not good at, man. Make me feel normal. Dancing. Are you a good dancer? I will mm-hmm. never dance, ever. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> You'll never see me dancing in your life. Well, he's 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 freshly twenty one. He's gonna have his first sip of alcohol soon. I'm sure we can get him dancing here in the next year or two. Never, you'll never <laughs> see me dancing. No, we don't have um, we don't have like in football like our celebration dances. Like we need we need the more of that yeah. in our sport. No, most you'll see me do is a is a little fist bump, just a little like. Okay, that's that's the extreme. Hold on, hold on. Do that, do that two more times. I'll put some beat to that. I'll remix it and edit it nicely. <laughs> I'm not getting done like Ethan Walker. Oh no! Yeah. Oh man, that, that was yeah. good. That was a good one. All right, so you guys are heading up here. You guys are uh, getting ready to play in a shootout together. You and uh, Hunter over there in the driver's seat. Um, you guys were talking about this for a long time you guys wanted this one so do you do you have a preference as far as race to 21 or shootout format or you just kind of enjoy it all i will take take 21 21. all every day every game ever i don't like shootout (laughs) well you won one so you did okay hey that that shootout i before my very first game of that shootout i was like i'm just gonna i'm losing Anyways, might as well just throw fast bags. See what I do, and then I ended up winning that one. I don't get it. <laughs> when you say fast bags, you mean the convicts or something even faster? Uh, I threw convicts in, in that. You did, okay. I say in we bracket play, you threw. I say you threw cutthroats all day in singles, heading into bracket play, right? At the national, yeah. Yeah. Not in. Uh, yeah. The na- not in the. Yeah, the national. Yeah, because I I asked you about the bags and I said you know the because uh, eerie and eerie the boards are really sticky that was a thing we kept hearing about and you said to me several times that's my preference like talk to me about why you prefer those boards to be sticky no matter what you, whether you're throwing a sticky or a fast bag. Um, it just allows for more control if I need to hit a cut shot, roll shot, any of those, sticky bag will allow for that every time. I mean, a sticky board will allow for that every time. Sticky board. Or yeah. A, uh, board. Like, even a fast board with a very slow bag, sometimes it still won't do it because of the board. But if you're using, if you're on really sticky boards, but even Oh, well, then we got to a dead zone. That's Hunter driving, it's messing it all up. <laughs> yeah, I but, know. I like uh, when you guys were driving. Uh, near the near the end of singles, though, it kind of looked like you just petered out a little bit. Um, were you just ready to get to the doubles portion of the broadcast, or you were just done with singles? Period. What? <laughs> were you just were you just done with singles period um, near the end of that uh, singles tournament and getting ready for doubles broadcast or what happened there? Um, I played that was like my fourth or fifth game without even a thirty second break. I was just done. I didn't want to play anymore. Do you and think though that it played to your advantage? No, because I was because- tired. Even though no, I, I mean, like, if you would have, if you would have continued, like, it, let's just say you didn't get tired and you won that game and you had to keep going, you would have been playing up until your doubles broadcast, and then you had that long game. I mean, yeah, it definitely would have been like more, more. Um, I would have been hotter going into like the doubles portion, but I probably would have been more tired as well. If like 
just having like a 20 minute break before the doubles, I would have been drained. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Go straight from singles into doubles, then it would have been a little bit better if I weren't like gas. Well, you know you're allowed five minutes in between each game. Don't be afraid to take that five minutes. Yeah, I didn't really think of that. Just sit there. Just sit there on the sideline, drink some water, and stare at your opponent for five minutes, and be like, "Yeah." <laughs> yeah, just get it. Just play mind games. Like I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get you right now. <laughs> Fisher wasn't missing, so uh, and I, I just, I didn't know what to do. I was tired. Yeah, yeah, I, no, I get that. And I was like, "All right, go ahead, Fisher." <laughs> just take it yeah. alright Tony we are out of time it's been awesome catching up with you on your drive over to uh, Arizona we look forward to seeing you there and uh, drive safe you and Hunter yep. see you soon yep. see you guys yeah. bye All right, so we didn't we don't have highlights, we don't have odds, so we're gonna wrap it up with some mindset with Mish today. Um, Wally, you brought up the topic of not caring what people think, and I was just curious what made you kind of propose that topic. All right, so I was kind of looking at um whenever I was playing Jake Brandon, we had that downtime. It was you and Allison on the mic, and I was playing Jake Brandon like this rubber band match, you know. And then I and I got to thinking about how my throw looks. And I'm like, you know what? I don't have a very pretty throw. Like, if I were to get on TV or something like that, I'm pretty sure people could, like, crop me out and put me in some weird positions and make some memes out of me or something like that. So how do I <laughs> stop caring about what people you think? Like, you're not talking about the actual bag. You're saying, like, what you look like when yeah, you throw? What Is that what you're like, you know, like, if I do something <laughs> like this, like, I could, cause like, some of these pros, you know what I mean? Like, you take Jimmy Humans, He has a nice... You know, farm a lot of these pros. They have a really pretty throw. They their technique looks good. Mine, not even close. Like I was like, man, is that what I really look like when I'm hitting amazing airmail drags? Like if we went and did a highlight reel shot and the ACL posts it, you know, and, it, and they see it over and over and over throughout the years, and then God forbid it's an amazing shot and I'm up for like shot of the year contention, and everybody gets to see it. I'm like, what am I gonna look like? <laughs> <laughs> this is what goes through my head, Nish. This is why I can't do good at the boards. No, I love, I love that you're thinking so big that you're making highlight reels on the ACL Facebook page. Like I'm excited mm -hmm. for that, Wally. I love that mm -hmm. your brain's going there. <laughs> yeah, I got, but I got I, Yeah, no, that sounds great. I will say that I personally prefer to be seen as underestimated or an underdog. So I feel like when your throw isn't as pretty kind of like what we're talking about with Jaime Sanchez, with Alan Rawls, like when we all talk about them, me and analysts and that kind of, we're all like, how, like, how it's not that pretty. Like, and because of that, they're continuously underestimated, right? They're like, I can't believe they're winning. I can't, like, I prefer to be in that position personally. I think I perform better in that position on the flip side. You have someone with the most beautiful, perfect bag, throw, release, everything. The expectations are super high now. It's like, well, this person better be freaking elite because everything about what they're doing is perfect. And then when they're not, it's like, what the F? Like, you should uh -huh. be better. So first of all, I just want to say, it's not a preferred place to be. In the underdog? Yeah. I mean, I feel like I've, you know, I'm not trying to brag or toot my own horn here, but I feel like I've made such a name for myself now. Whenever people see me throw, they're kind of like, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I expect you to be better. And, and then I always come back with, hey, I'm good at talking about Cornell. I'm not good about throwing Cornell. You know I what I mean? I claim to be elite. <laughs> yeah. That's on you for having the wrong perception of me. Uh, Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's, that's funny though. So, d d so with that if they're like oh i thought it'd be better like does that actually you actually care does that weigh on you oh yeah oh yeah yeah okay. I, I would i would like to like my vision for myself is i want to get you know better than tony smith so that way oh. i can take him at a cash game without him expecting it or seeing it coming but i want to do it behind the scenes you know not like it opens or anything like that i just want to put in the work or, or something whatever it takes and I just want to come out of nowhere with it. Like, that's my perception. I, I live okay. for the moment where it's like, wow, didn't see that coming, you know? Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, first of all, I'll say, you know, 
you started off with not caring what people think. And that is the most important thing because if you're doing it for the gold stars, the accolades, the praise, the external reward system, then you're already losing. <laughs> like that, that is a very short term motivation. Just, you know, we have to find what's called intrinsic motivation or the way that I'll ask my clients when I'm working with them about to, to gauge where they are, I'll say, if nobody could ever see you do it, whatever it is, you know, lose 30 pounds, make the highlight reel, whatever. Like if nobody could ever confirm that you did it, would you still want it? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I would probably say yes, as far as the losing the 30 pounds thing goes, because that's a me <laughs> thing. That is okay. a, that is, I catch myself in the reflection somewhere and I get instantly, <laughs> but, uh, skill wise, no, I had skill wise. I want her for the recognition. Yeah. And so that way I would say that that's like a, that's a goal that you probably won't reach because it's not deep enough, right? Like yeah. the amount of dedication and, and discipline it would take to achieve a goal that's only surface based is only based on other people witnessing it and giving you gold stars and accolades. Um, you're already starting off in not a very good position. And it's also not going to be very fulfilling because you have to feel really good about what you're doing, regardless of what anybody else thinks, or you're kind of screwed. And so it's like really trying to find that balance of like, hey, I want to accept compliments and things when they're given to me because it's important to be able to receive, but I also don't need them because I have it so much coming from my, in, like me, myself internally, right? Like I'm good. I'm good. I know I'm good at this. I know I'm get, I'm getting all the praise I need from myself. So I don't necessarily need it outside, but it's also, I'm also not going to stop it. I'm going to allow it to come in because I want to be open to receive. Yeah. I think the other thing too, where it came from is like on the broadcast, they were doing the bag giveaways and stuff like that and dance, you know, they had dance contests and like I was out there just having a good time. I was vibing. I was dancing. I just, I didn't care. I was in the moment. I enjoyed myself. People enjoyed it. And then, like, somebody came up to me afterwards, like, man, you were pretty drunk last night. And I was like, no, not even close. Like, we had one beer the entire broadcast. And even though if you look in the background, every time they hit a 12 on 12, we were doing socials. But that was one beer. It was the same beer. And I was just out there having a good time. But, uh, like, the perception that somebody thought I had to get drunk to have a good time was kind of like, man, that kind of took away from me just having a good time. That's their story, though, right? Right? Because they would yeah. do that sober. Right? And I think that that like, I, I have the same thing. I'll talk to people about like, I love dancing. I love it so much. It's, it's not because I'm good at it. I just love it. Um, and so if we're like going to go out to the club. Um, I, I'm like, I actually don't drink when I go out dancing. And they're like, what? Like, I, I couldn't go to the club and dance without drinking. I'm like, no, I love it so much. Yeah, I just drink I, water. I want to, I, I want to last. No, I couldn't do it. I couldn't. I'm, I'm like there with Tony. <laughs> but you did it. Yeah, but it, like it, it's it's not there's definitely not a sober activity for me, and it was just like a spur of the moment, what forty second thing. Like there was <laughs> there was no longevity to it. Well, to wrap it up, I think what I really want to make sure people understand is that any goal you want to achieve, you have to find intrinsic motivation. So if it's externally based only, you got to dig a little bit deeper and either let it go and realize I ex I must not want this that bad, or really dig your heels and it'd be like, this is why it matters to me. And then when you do that, you're getting everything internally. So you just don't need the external praise. You don't care what people think because it's your world. It's your process, your yeah. goal. Find, find your why. It's your, finding your why and owning and, and not needing it to come from anybody else. And that's when you really find success. So that is uh, what I'll say on that one. But looks like that's all we got time for for today, everyone. Uh, we'll see you uh, in Mesa, if you're going to be there. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. Here you go.